Okay, everybody, um, wherever, wherever everybody is, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to the fourth edition of ICUCHA's webinar chain. Um, before I introduce Emad and uh, we, we get the presentations underway, as many of you will be aware, the last few days has seen some, some very bad news cross our desks. The loss of uh, George Bass, Patrice Palmey, and of course, somebody who is extremely dear to Ikuch, and, and that's Tice Marleveld. Um, very sad days. Um, I want to just share with you some of the comments about Tice that we received on the announcement, just in terms of his characteristics. Uh, some of you will be very familiar with the term. He was a friend, he was a guide. We owe him, and I include myself in that, with the guidance he gave me during my, my thesis. A dynamic field archeologist, scholar, made fabulous and meaningful contributions. And I think one thing that I would like to add myself, he was extremely generous with his time. Tice always had time for everybody, whether they were a professor or one of his students. We all know his legacy, the students that have been taught and educated through Esberg, the uh, course at Southern Denmark University, but many other things. Valued member of ICUCH, past president, contributor to the development of the 2001 UNESCO Convention, and many other things. And we, we could go on and on and on and talk about um, what Tice did for our discipline. But also I'd like to share with you um, something else. And for some months now, um, Tice has been involved and continued to work right up to the last moments, really, which again shows the strength of his personality. He was involved in a, a project, European project, um, and I can't go into detail because it's very sensitive and the final report has not been made public. And Tice made um, a commitment to keeping this under the radar until that was made public, which should be in a few days time, um, related to the last days of the Second World War. Very important project and had a maritime component. And I guess we'll be reading about that very shortly. We also, Ikut would like to tell its members and everybody that um, some of you may not be aware that uh, Ikut is about to publish a second Heritage at Risk volume. And we've included Tice's in the dedication of the book to him. As well as this morning, um, his widow should have received our contribution are of respect. Um, and we, of course, wish the family well. It's been a sad few days. And also we would like to dedicate the two speakers today, the two presentations by Emad Khalil and Martin Mondes um, to Tice's memory. That said, I'd like to announce Emad. Um, good friend, many years of, of talking with him uh, since his time at Southampton University. And Emad, I'm absolutely fascinated by your project. I, I do not know anything about it, sad to say, but I'm bound to learn a lot about it in the next 25 minutes. So Emad, would you like to share your screen and tell us about the Mar Marsa Bagus project? Thank you very much, uh, Chris. And um, I certainly share with you uh, Sadness and uh, uh, about Tice. And um, Tice, who was actually the one who introduced me to Kuch in 2006 uh, when he was in Alexandria. And uh, since then, I have been involved uh, closely, uh, working closely with Tice, and he guided me during my years of the presidency. Uh, he was a sweet man beside everything else. So, yeah, God bless your soul. Uh, um, I'll be sharing my screen, and here it is. Sure. Uh, can you see it now? Is it is it proper? Can you see it? Uh, uh, yes. It's perfect. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Um, the word Morsa actually uh, means uh, harbor in Arabic. The word Morsa, Morsa, anything is harbor. Uh, Marsa Bush, Marsa Reika, Marsa Muracham, all these Marsas are harbor. So uh, when we speak about Marsa Bagush, it's the harbor of the site uh, of Bagush. 
on the northwest coast of Egypt. Uh, the, the project is carried out by the University of Alexandria, by the Center for Modern Archaeology, and it's funded by the Honor Frost Foundation since 2015. So for the past six years, we have been uh, generously funded by the foundation, and I hope this will uh, continue in Um The site uh, is actually owned by the university. Um, this is uh, quite exceptional because the land of the site of Martha the Bush is a property of Alexandria University since 1968. And since that time, uh, every year, there's a summer camp uh, that takes place in this site. Uh, during the months of summer, like maybe three months every year, uh, where every week a group of students and staff members would be going to stay in the tents for uh, five days, you know, just you know, having some nice time, fishing, swimming, and so on. Of course, the, the odd uh, group is my group, uh, because we only go diving. Uh, this is the only group in the university to actually go diving. So I have been going to most of the bush since I was a child, actually, with my father, because he was also a professor at the university. So I know the site very well, but uh, I have never noticed any archaeology, maybe because I was not looking. Uh, so um, in 2010, we were uh, at the camp with the students, and we were snorkeling and just, you know, having a nice time. And then we came across uh, herds of pottery. Here is the bay, or the Marsa, as it is. And this is where we, uh, this is where we, uh, just let me get the pointer. Uh, yes, this is where we found the, uh, the church of pottery. Uh, obviously, it was amphora, very clear, uh, broken amphora. And from the first view, uh, we can uh, realize that it is uh, early Roman uh, amphora. This was in 2010, uh, 11 years ago. The process of uh, obtaining a permission and uh, securing the funding and so on, it took us some time, and we did not start actually working uh, on the site until later. But from the first views while snorkeling, uh, we can realize that the site is quite shallow, uh, visibility is very good, and the amphora shirts are extending for tens of meters every direction. They are not concentrated in one uh, single spot, but uh, they are more like uh, a number of clusters or a number of concentrations of amphora uh, spreading uh, in different places around the uh, around the Marsa or around the bay. Mostly of the same date. At that time, we didn't we did not realize any differences because we didn't examine anything closely. It was just from sport. Um, this is uh, where Marsa Babush is. It is about. The middle way between, Alexa between uh, Alexandria and the Libyan border, almost halfway, uh, 250 kilometers from each, uh, east of Alexandria, uh, west of Alexandria, sorry, and east of the Libyan border. Uh, and, and it is one of several marsas or several natural bays or embayments along the north coast of Egypt. However, most of them, unfortunately, have been uh, reclaimed or built over. Um, by, you know, resource and hotels and stuff like this. It's a common problem in the Mediterranean, and it is obviously the case in Egypt. Also. So many of these marshes or these bays uh, do not exist anymore. They are just built over and they are unreachable. Probably the only thing that saved Babouche is the fact that it's owned by the university. So no one is building one. So this is where it is. And um, um, I, we started digging into archives and ancient documents and trying to figure out what, what these pottery uh, lots are doing there. So uh, the most uh, significant reference in this case is the uh, 3rd century AD uh, guide known as the Stadianus Maris Magni. It's a sailing guide, basically, like the Periplus Maris Eletriae for the Red Sea, for example. This is the Stadianus Maris Magni, or uh, the distances of the Great Sea, the Maris Magni, uh, from the 3rd century AD. And what, what this document uh, have is uh, a list of all possible harbors and anchorages along the north coast of uh, Africa. Uh, so um, as we were looking into uh, research, we came across this statement where the document says that from Luke Acte uh, to Zigris, there is a distance of 90 stadia. Luke Acte is a known site. It's, it's known. It's a verified site. This headland um, currently is known as Ras al Hekma. Ras is head in Arabic. So it's the headland of wisdom. Hekma is, is 
wisdom. So it's the headland of wisdom. Um, and uh, from this side to uh, a place called Zegris, uh, 90 stadia, so about 17 kilometers. And in this side of Zegris, there is an islet, and the guide is advising sailors and ships to put into the place with it, with the islet, on your left, there is water in the sand. So this is the main statement, actually, or the main uh, 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 evidence, textual evidence, we came across concerning the site of Zigris or Marsa Bagush. This distance between Luke Akti and Bagush is almost exactly 17 kilometers. I mean, I've I've measured it in several ways, and it's almost exactly 17, 18 kilometers. So it's very accurate, actually. Um, again, this map was drawn based on the Sadiamus Marish Magni. Uh, here's Alexandria, and here is uh, Zigris, and um, uh, almost approaching to the Libyan borders. Uh, so it's verified that it is one of the uh, sites mentioned in the Sadiamus Marish Magni. Looking at the Bay of Bagush, it's very much confirming what the document is saying. There is an islet, here it is, and probably in antiquity it was completely separated from the coast because this is all sand and it's just moving with the different uh, weather conditions. So um, it was an islet and uh, he's advising the, uh, the boats to put in with this island on the left-hand side, which is the only way to get into the harbor. So it's very much uh, uh, proving what the document is saying. Uh, so we were almost certain that this is the site of Zigris mentioned in the Sadiamish Um Looking more into, into uh, uh, evidence, we realized that this site was actually surveyed in the 19th century by the British Navy. Um, it was a project carried out by the Navy at that time to survey a lot of sites in North Africa, and including this site of Martha Bush, and it's written in different, different uh, uh, pronunciations. It's, it's uh, written back double, with a double Q. Um, and uh, this is the same time, the same scale, the same everything, the same headland, and it is a confirmation that this is what we are looking at. So the project started in 2015, and uh, the objective of the project was to conduct a systematic survey of the site and try to understand what this is, um, and to try to develop some 3D models of the uh, remains, uh, used basically for education purposes and to show the students back at the university and try to develop some sort of a management plan for the site because no one knew about the site at all except us. Um, starting the research, we realized that these um, uh, clusters or these concentrations of amphora are ending. Uh, they are uh, spread all over the northern border of this uh, bay uh, in different locations. And it is evident of uh, uh, not just one shipwreck, but at least uh, two or maybe three, as I'm going to mention uh, in a minute. Uh, these specific type of amphora are very easy to recognize in Egypt because these are Egyptian amphora, typically made in uh, the Alexandria region. And it was believed until very recently that these were made specifically for local consumption and not for export. Uh, this is the type of amphora that existed there, very much the same. Uh, these are known as Egyptian amphora type 3, um, and it is a typology specifically uh, to Egyptian uh, ceramics or Roman ceramics or Roman uh, amphora. And as I mentioned, it was produced in Egypt, and most, uh, mostly it was used for local uh, consumption and not for uh, export, at least that's what we thought. Uh, this is the type. Uh, unfortunately, I'm trying to type 12, first century BC to the second century AD. And uh, in fact, the area just around Alexandria, to the, to the west of Alexandria, has a lot of evidence for producing this specific type of amphora. Uh, different uh, types of amphora kilns and wasters for making this type of amphora exist around uh, Alexandria. And this is just one of the wasters. Uh, along the north coast of the uh, Mariut uh, Lake, just, just uh, west of Alexandria. Here's Alexandria. And all these little dots here are amphora production sites. Not just of this type, but of other Egyptian types as well, as I'm going to mention. So this is one of them, and there are a few more Egyptian, uh, Roman Egyptian amphora that were produced in this place. So the same amphoras, almost certainly, the same clay were found in Marsa Bagush. So this is an evidence of a ship that actually 
departing or leaving from Alexandria, heading along the northwest coast of Africa. So this is Egyptian origin. However, the site also included other entrances from other times and other dates, other origins. So we are not looking at one type or one shipwreck, but we are looking at a number of ships uh, starting from the Hellenistic period, the second century BC, all the way until the low, late Roman period. So we have this late Roman pottery from Gaza. Uh, we have uh, Dresden one from, uh, from Italy. Uh, we have Cohen Amphra from Kos, Kodian Amphras, uh, North African Amphra. So we are looking at busy sites, a busy site with a lot of activities going on. Uh, we have raised some samples for dating and for typology um, and uh, to, to just document them. And we managed to put them back in the water uh, to keep them there. Uh, we, we haven't uh, raised anything back to Alexandria except some specific uh, uh, pieces, as I mentioned later. But generally, it was just raised, dated, uh, photographed, and placed back uh, on the wood. Uh, this is the earliest uh, amphora we have. It's the uh, amphora from Nidos, uh, from the second century BC. And you can see it's almost direct line from Knidos to Zygris to Baguj, uh, which I thought, thought was very interesting. If, it, if the boat was directly from Knidos to Zygris, it would just have sailed in one line and get there. Uh, it has a stamp of a xenon type. It's a very famous type of Knidian amphora with a stamp of the letter the ZEN. In addition to amphora, we start coming across more evidence for shipwrecks like roof tile. Um, in fact, although I have been in this field for so many years, but I have never seen roof tiles on this ever in any place else. Uh, this is the only site I have seen uh, roof tiles underwater, and we have a lot of them. Actually. Several pieces of roof tiles uh, were located there. In addition to frames from uh, ships, obviously, with some more antenna uh, uh, fastening clear there. Um, and uh, it was very surprising in the same bay to find another cluster of completely different type of pottery, which has nothing to do with the Roman period or the Hellenistic period. It's very typical Islamic or uh, late uh, medieval uh, pottery, including this imitation of. Uh, of porcelain, not porcelain. Um, different types of amphora. So this, this is completely uh, this was confirmed when we uh, came across those two grapnel ends, uh, which are probably uh, from the same day previously mentioned uh, ceramics. Uh, they both date back probably to the uh, late medieval uh, period. So those two grapnel anchors probably belong to the same uh, ship. Uh, we ended actually marking all the uh, clusters of amphora, uh, of anchors, uh, 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 roof tiles, and wooden planks. And this was the end result. We have a very small bay, which is only 900 meters. In, in, uh, in length from east to west, quite small, but it's full of uh, remains. And it seems that ships, as they were entering the bay, uh, maybe during bad weather, or maybe uh, ships did not know where to come from, but they have those uh, stocks. Uh, the bay actually is, is surrounded from the north with a number of these reefs just under the water level, just under the sea level. So it might not be easy to recognize until you are very close to it. Uh, so probably this is how uh, those ships ended wrecking this uh, site. So far, we have a confirmation that this is uh, Marsabagut, this is actually Zigris. We have a confirmation of uh, the uh, uh, base that we, we, uh, we came across, but that, that left us with, uh, the statement that was mentioned in the Sadianus Maris Magni about uh, water in the sand, uh, which was quite weird in, in, in sense. I mean, how can water be in the sand? Uh, but we thought, well, we have seen uh, water, in, so let's start looking in the sand. So we went actually surveying around the uh, around the uh, bay, um, and we actually utilized the uh, knowledge and resources of the locals there. 
Um, this is inhabited by, uh, by Bedouins, by locals. So we start asking them about any idea about what water in the sand meant. And I think it took us like five minutes after asking them that they said, well, yeah, I we know what this is. Let's, let's, let's follow us. And they took us to this uh, system. Uh, this is a huge big system. They have installed uh, uh, a pump, a water pump, to drain water out of this system, which is still have water until now. Just next to this cistern, uh, we came across another cistern, and a third one, and a fourth one, and more cisterns. And all of them, they still have water in them, and this is water in the sand. Um, so we start actually getting into the cistern and trying to, uh, to document it. Uh, and we realized that it still have water, as you can see. These are the pipes that the locals have installed to uh, draw water out of the cisterns, used for irrigation. And the systems keep extending for hundreds of meters underground. Uh, beautifully, yeah, very nice. Even the Mark tools are still there. Uh, this is probably Roman. Um, and they just keep extending, going on and on and on. And they're interconnected. So we have this network of, uh, of underground cisterns with water in it, just a few meters away. Um, and this water comes from the uh, mountains, from the groundwater. Just seepage of groundwater uh, traveling through rocks, filtrating. So it's very nice, very clean water. And this is going on and on and on and on. Uh, so we managed to document some of them. And you can see the distances between each opening is quite, quite short distance, 14 meters. And the, the, the uh, system, system exists at four meters below the, uh, the ground level. So we have, we have uh, registered or documented for just very close from the uh, shoreline. So um, more digging, we actually realized that information, I mean, we realized that this site actually was used for, during World War II. And it was very known, very well known. The internet is full of information about the site of Bagush. The problem is that Bagush is written in English in very different ways. Sometimes with a G, sometimes with a Q, sometimes with double Qs, sometimes with double Gs. And it's so, I mean, you have to look into all this to extract the information. This is probably why I didn't find anything useful at the beginning. But when I start changing the, the, the spelling of the word, we came across a ton of information about the squadron, the Royal Air Force squadron that was based there, even the names of people that, that were stationed there during World War II. And it seems that. The main reason this site was so busy is because of fresh water, because of the existence of groundwater, fresh water in the middle of the desert. So this was the main uh, reason for attract, attracting uh, the, uh, the Royal Air Force camps to be there. Still until today, the, 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 uh, the installments and the foundations of the camps, the British camps still exist until now. This is a photograph from the World War II, and this is the actual site that uh, took photo of a couple of ago. And you can still see everything. They are still uh, very much the same. So um, it was really very interesting so far. The Stadiamus Mars Magni was, was telling the truth. Until now, let's push it a bit further and see what the document says about other harbors. So the document says that the Damantia, another bay, is only three kilometers, 3.5 kilometers. So this is very close by. And in this La Damantia, this harbor, there is um, an island, a larger island. And the document is, is advising sailors to put into it with the island on your right hand side this time, not the left hand side like the previous time. And there is a harbor accessible with any wind. So 3.5 kilometers is very close. Uh, so actually, we went looking for that amount, 3.5 kilometers away from Zygris. And yeah, clear, it's there. Here is Zygris, here is Babush. And here is Ladamantia, which is also Babush. This entire area is called Marsa Babush. This whole area in Arabic now is known as Marsa Babush. But this bay is quite larger, um, and there is an island. And getting into the bay is the island have to be on the right-hand side. So this is confirming the information from the someone looking in this bay. 
and you start finding for the first time impact um, because the bay is a bit deeper uh, in, the, in, the, in the first uh, harbor, the depth is never greater than five or six meters. In this one, it goes up to 18 meters. So it's much deeper and you can see intact amphora. Emat, we cannot hear your voice. Yeah, I, I was muted by the uh, by the system for some reason. I, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. But it okay. will be very nice if you repeat the last two minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. So so far, this is the other side that we have. Been uh, looking at uh, La Damantia, just very close to uh, the original site. And we came across uh, a lot of intact amphora this time, because the site is deeper, about 80 meters average depth. So we find uh, a lot of you know, North African amphora coming from Tunisia, uh, Africa coming from Italy, from North Africa, from, sorry, from uh, Palestine, from the Palestinian coast. Uh, uh, so it's a variety of, of uh, amphora, obviously from not, not from the same date. Uh, those four were excavated based on the request of the museum in Alexandria. They are developing a display for amphora and they asked uh, us to uh, raise those uh, five. So uh, we did this last summer. Um, dating the pottery that was found in uh, Bagouf, uh, we realized it's coming from basically everywhere very busy harbor, although it's, it's remote, it's 250 kilometers away from Alexandria, but it's very busy. Uh, different shipwrecks of different parts of different dates from different origins uh, uh, have been, you know, wrecked there for some reason, one reason or another. Then we started coming across a lot of anchors. Um, stone anchors, um, iron, uh, uh, sorry, uh, lead stock anchors, uh, Roman lead stock anchors. We have think, two of them, three or four of them. And then Roman anchors, Roman iron anchors. And actually, I have not seen this concentration of anchors at the same place anywhere else except in the harbor of Alexandria. But anywhere else in Egypt, I have not came, I haven't come across this uh, big number of anchors just in a small area. So we have. Roman anchors, more Roman anchors, more anchors, and more anchors and more anchors. And wherever you go, there are anchors of different types and different sizes and different dates, all the way until 19th century Admiralty anchor. Uh, so again, this is an evidence of how busy this site might have uh, been during the past 2000 years. Uh, this is just a simple map we developed for the uh, anchors. Uh, we have a concentration so far of 32 of them. And uh, 32 anchors in one side, this is the largest number recorded in Egypt outside Alexandria. So um, I think this is very interesting. Uh, the latest or the most recent find we came across was this uh, inscription, I guess. In this island there, the island that was mentioned in Fabianus Maris Magni. Um, one of my colleagues actually was just swimming across and then walking uh, on this island when he came across this inscription. Someone just wrote some English letters on the rocks, engraving them on the rocks. And he took a photo and we went back and looked at it. And it looked, you know, very weird. I mean, it's written in English, not in Arabic. So why would someone write, you know, letters in English uh, on this island? 
Uh, well, I tried to sort all this out and uh, looking at the letters carefully, the spelling came as you can see, HMS Palm Board. And I had no clue what HMS Palm Board is. HMS is a ship, obviously, but Palm Board. So I started looking, trying to figure out what the hell is HMS Palm Board doing there in Marta Lagouche in Egypt. And when I came across this map, and this map was developed in 1939 uh, based on a survey carried out in Marsa Babouj by HMS Tombo. Um, apparently, this is a, a Royal Navy ship that was carrying the, one of the surveys along the north uh, coast of Africa, and it came to the site, and it did this metric survey of uh, Marsa Babouj, and it was uh, uh, published in this map. And actually, uh, I mean, I was very happy find out what HMS Palm Bowen was. But again, the pathometric survey was very useful because we, we digitized the survey and we managed to put it on the actual satellite image and it was very accurate sitting there. So all of a sudden we have a pathometric uh, survey of the site that we are surveying uh, from a document that was produced in 1939. So I'm very grateful for the Royal Navy for doing this actually. So um, this is what we have done so far, looking at those two Pipes, um, the first one and the second one, but the distance between them are still not looked at. So we have this entire area to survey during the coming years. We don't have, we have no idea what exists here. We just looked at this embayment and that embayment. So we are planning starting from next summer, inshallah, maybe June or so, uh, to go and try to cover uh, these areas. And hopefully, we might be using some uh, science plan sonar. Uh, this time to try to uh, cover a, a larger uh, larger distance. So uh, this is uh, the next step, and uh, hopefully, uh, so far we got uh, funding from the HFF, so we are very grateful for them uh, for the coming three years. Uh, so this is a very good news, me personally. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Emad. It was. Um... As usual, very nice uh, presentation. And from the first second uh, until the last one, I watched carefully what you told and what you show as archaeological remain to us. And as you know, we are working at the Turkish coast of Mediterranean, and our remains are exactly very similar or yeah, same yeah, I'm sure from the is. from the Bronze Age yeah. until the uh, last century. We see. Uh, all kind of uh, your remains yeah. in this yeah. part of Mediterranean, and yeah. it is very really nice. Uh, yeah. uh, dear colleagues, we are working with Emad uh, not only in Aykut, Ikomos, um, also we were together at the uh, uh, founding of UNESCO Unity in Underwater Archaeology Network, and we yeah. are also working at Sima Scientific Committee together, yes. and working with Emad is honor and pleasure and thank you oh, very much pleasure. again thank you. for this very nice presentation uh, thank you thank you, thank uh, you. okay it was Hakan and is one of the uh, moderator of this webinar program and now uh, uh, now uh, i would like to invite chris to uh, call to martin mindless martin are you listening and are you good to go um, Martin is going to speak about in-situ preservation, which, uh, just to remind a few people, is that ICUJ recently responded to an invitation from UNESCO, the 2001 Secretariat, to help clarify what is perceived as a misunderstanding about the terminology relating to in-situ preservation. I'm sure Martin will make it much clearer for everybody. Thanks, Martin. When you're ready. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good, good. Then I hope that everybody else can hear me too. Can you hear see my screen? Yes, I can. There's oh. just a bit of background noise coming from somewhere. Uh, that might be my computer. It's not the most uh, modern one. So um, uh, I think I think this is just what we need to, uh, or what what we uh, what we have. So um, I hope that I am clear enough for people to hear me. Just say so if. No, we hear you loud and clear. Okay, good. Then, then just think about planes, uh, airplanes. If I, 
if I see a much presentation, then I uh, I want to go into the field again. We are not allowed to do that at the moment. So uh, uh, I saw all these nice pictures, um, and now we're getting mostly pictures from uh, the North Sea and the Baden Sea, which is uh, less clear. Uh, but indeed, uh, today I want to talk about uh, the in situ preservation of sites. Uh, as part of the uh, underwater cultural heritage um, management. And um, I, I see that it's already uh, 1740, so I, pro I will um, pass the 1800 hours. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Um, so um, uh, as we all know, uh, in situ preservation uh, is an important part of the uh, Treaty of, um, um, of Valletta or Malta from 1992 in Europe but also, of course, the ICOMAS Charter in 1996 and the UNESCO Convention 2001. But then immediately the uh, question rises, what is in situ preservation? Um, and uh, most of you have been, um, uh, have been working uh, with the terminology, uh, but still there was some um, unclarity about this. But also, what is in situ preservation and what do we mean with that if we have, as UNESCO said, 3 million uh, shipwrecks? Or if I go to the Netherlands, if we have 60,000 sites uh, on the seabed, uh, what does in situ preservation mean then? And I will just start to um, uh, explain this to you because is in situ preservation maybe this magic pill that we always thought that it would be? And it was so popular at a certain stage, and that's quite a few uh, years ago, that it became a, a, a real important part. And that was the moment that all these international um, uh, uh, treaties were uh, developed because everybody saw something positive in in situ preservation. Archaeologists want to preserve um, uh, their, their sites, but there was also a lot of uh, uh, work connected to it. Uh, politicians uh, thought uh, that it was a great way of, uh, of, of, of not paying too much um, uh, for uh, in situ uh, for, for ships, right? shipwrecks because excavation was very expensive uh, and so on. There were all sorts of uh, groups of stakeholders that thought that in situ preservation may be this magic uh, pill, this panacea. Um, but the question is, is this um, uh, in situ preservation, is this th that preferred option as I more or less sketch, or is it just a tool just, or is it a tool of, uh, for management and uh, an option in a series of other options? Or in other words, is this this fundamental radical approach uh, uh, saying that we need to preserve for future generations, or can we look at it a little bit more pragmatically? Um, so, that's part of the talk that I'm, um, I, I'm having now. Um, and, but I first want to go to the technicalities, to the management of underwater cultural heritage in which in situ preservation is part. So if we look at the, um, uh, the process from desk-based research to uh, prospection, to archaeological significance. And please look at the right side. You see deselection, deselection. I get back to that as well. But you see a kind of a linear way of in situ preservation. And in a way, that is more or less what we've always been thinking about in situ preservation. We preserve the sites in situ. And then, uh, well, uh, the monitoring, maybe we do that. But at least uh, we will not go back to our resources after we've done in situ preservation. But it could be a little bit more of a little bit less linear with also um, uh, uh, going back to in situ preserved sites and start some excavations. Um, so there are uh, there's a different uh, a view and there's a different skill. Uh, you can be more than radical and you, but also and very important, you can have a view from site by site by site, looking at wrecks and uh, decide if we have to preserve them in situ or not, if we think they're important enough to preserve in situ or not. Or we can look at it from a more um, narrative kind of a way, more from, uh, from, from a larger uh, scale, let's say, at the bay that the Emat was uh, looking at, uh, it has it has stories, and and maybe you're not preserving only one site, but you preserve it in its 
context with the other sides and you take decisions what to be uh, what to preserve or not so you can a uh, skill it is uh, very important in the management I'll, I'll get back to those things um if we look at it from a little bit larger scale then you see uh then you you you, you can uh, do some inventories on the known sources as i said in the netherlands we have about sixty thousand locations and we can uh uh, put them all next to each other and start to um, uh, pick out the ones that we really want to uh, preserve in a narrative kind of a way, because that's how we look at it. Um, but then we still miss something. And what we miss is those ones that we uh, each year uh, discover again, and especially the ones that we don't discover, uh, because there is a lot of resources that we haven't found up until now, and but those uh, resources we can predict so we can predict our uh, resources and put them into account when we start our management process of in situ so we can preserve sites in situ even if we haven't found them and that's when we start to uh, look at the site instead of, instead of only the individual uh, objects or the individual shipwrecks and by doing that we also uh, um, uh, know more about the development of the area, the evolution of the area, and therefore also the story of the area, uh, area the narrative of the area. And that's connected to the different sites. So if we have assessed those sites and even assessed the area with all the uh, uh, locations that can be of great value to find to objects or uh, are maybe less, uh, important for um, uh, for finding sites, then there is actually a few options left. Uh, first of all, the selection. Well, who is talking about the selection of site? The selection of site is very important. I'll come back to that in the later stage in the last uh, few slides of my presentation. But we also have in situ preservation, as I said, and of course, excavation. But in situ preservation and excavation mean also more work. In situ preservation, the monitoring, monitoring after monitoring after monitoring, how far do we go? Uh, and excavation, we also uh, have the lifting, the conservation, and deposition. But we have to document and we have to do the interpretation of uh, all the information as well. So it doesn't stop after we decided that we have to uh, uh, preserve a site in situ. So in situ preservation is a choice in cultural heritage management. And it is a choice, but it's not an activity on its own. So why do we preserve in situ? Why, uh, why do we want to do that? That's one of the first questions that we ask ourselves because it's not a process by its own. It is because we want to do something. Well, first of all, it is threatened at a large scale. We all know that. Um, but also we can preserve sites for our next generations. Uh, have, so we preserve the objects that we think are, are important for next generations. What they think is their uh, choice. Uh, but also we've developed law to do so. So why not um, uh, uh, use that law to protect, of course. Um, there are many known sites. I just said 3 million. Who knows how many there are in the world, but 60,000 in the Netherlands at least. And then we have, of course, the unknown sites. In situ preservation can be cost effective, but if you, I already showed you that there's still a lot of uh, costs uh, concerned with it. And there is often a considerable time period between discovery and further action. So if you find the site, it doesn't mean that you immediately can excavate. So in between, you have to do in situ preservation as well. And of course, there is also a lack of knowledge in conservation of specific uh, types of sites, like for example, large island ships. If we bring them up, we will have a big problem. So the threats, let me just go very quickly through them. Um, uh, of course, we have those mechanical and those biological processes to the nervalis, for example, or the chemical processes, but I want to focus on the anthropogenic processes. Um, just a quick uh, a, a look, because 
uh, although natural uh, erosion is of um, uh, huge uh, influence, especially with the climate change, uh, the, uh, what we do as people on the seabed is enormous, from the fishery to the souvenir hunting. But uh, for example, think of, if we look at the North Sea, uh, between England and the Netherlands and Belgium, um, uh, and Norway, it's, it, it's not a very large sea, but there are already 60,000 pro uh, 60, uh, uh, projects for uh, building wind farms. So it is an enormous activity going on uh, on the seabed. So the threats are big. Yeah, look at what um, the, the North Sea looks like. It's pipelines, it's dredging, it's those oil platforms, it's the wind farms. Um, so the disturbance is huge. Uh, so there are so many threats uh, and there are so many sites to uh, uh, protect. We have to know what we want to protect or what we need to protect. So that goes through uh, assessments, it goes through selections, and it goes through prioritizing. And we have to develop tools for to do all these things. And we need to make choices. That is very important. Uh, we have to prioritize our cultural significance. Um, uh, we look, have to look at the possibilities to protect. If we can't protect them, there is two joint chances uh, left. One is deselecting, the other one is excavating. Uh, we have to look at the resources, what do we have? And we have to look at the responsibilities. But if we want to make choices, we need to have knowledge. And this knowledge has to be on the intrinsic value, and of course, also on the conditions of the environment in the site. And without this, in situ preservation is not possible or is a farce. Uh, intrinsic value, because we need to know which site we value more and which site we value less. So without that, no in situ pro protection. Uh, but also the changes in, um, uh, in the environment. Look at the right side, so the er erosion, sedimentation uh, process around the shipwreck visit and 11. Um, if the conditions change, we might not be even able to pres uh, preserve the site. So without knowledge about the environment, no in situ preservation is possible, or at least again, it is a farce. So, and that same is about the uh, management of the environment because the whole environment may be shifting. Look at um, here, this is part of the Bonzi, which is, uh, has a lot of processes going on. If we don't know about that, then again, in situ preservation is a far. So it is not just the easy way in situ preservation. There's a lot of things that we have to keep in mind. In situ preservation is actually managing changes. So, in seed preservation, managing changes and mitigating against threats to avoid the loss of information and to avoid the loss of the value of the sites. How do we do that? How do we uh, preserve? How do we protect? We can do that passively, of course, with the law and the policy, but also actively uh, by um, uh, preserving the sites physically in situ. And below, I will very be very short in this, uh, below you see uh, the MOSS projects from the early 2000s, Machu, Red Protect, and SASMAP. Uh, look them up uh, on the internet. Uh, those are large European projects where we did all sorts of testing on how we can physically protect shipwrecks, from sandbags to barriers, uh, or polypropylene nets to cover up sites, uh, and the uh, artificial seagrass as well. Uh, and all these things are known and have been. Um, uh, investigated in length. So uh, check, check those things out. We can preserve sites in situ, but only if we know how the environment behaves. Without that, it's not possible. So what do we do? We preserve the sites in situ and we start to monitor the sites. Uh, here you see a site that we have to have been monitoring since uh, actually since the end of the 90s. Uh, uh, and we still do this every year. So our commitment to preserve the site has been ongoing because we thought it was important to preserve, so we keep on preserving it. And that costs a lot of money. So I'll just quickly go through this. Uh, but there is one big problem about in-situ preservation. Um, as underwater archaeology is, or archaeological sites underwater are, uh, 
underwater means often out of sight and therefore out of mind. But just think about one of the most important uh, stakeholders that we have, sports divers. They find a shipwreck and what do we do as archaeologists? We say, this is a very important site, let's cover it up. So what does it do with the public support or the support of the divers? This is quite difficult. Uh, so you can make an artificial uh, reef, but it may be quite uh, uh, difficult. So um, if we do in situ preservation, we have to think of one other thing. Why are we preserving it in situ? Uh, what is the value and how do people value it? It may be important because of the enjoyment. It may be uh, important for commemoration uh, or the site may be important for science. And if we know why the site is so important, then we can also take measures to do the right uh, the right thing. If a site is very important for enjoyment, of course you will not cover it up completely. Uh, so we'll, therefore we have to know, uh, sorry, why we preserve the sites in situ. So why uh, preservation and, uh, and protection? We uh, preserve for the future. Uh, so we transfer the, the, the sites to next generations because we think that it is important what they do, they can decide later on. It's also a storage for later research for ourselves and our guide. We can preserve for enjoyment, but of course also because shipwrecks are good for the biodiversity and the hard substrate, and we can cooperate between ourselves. And of course, commemoration, like for example, World War II wrecks, which are war based. So experience and enjoyment may be what other people are looking for and we have to keep that in mind as archaeologists uh, so there may be a friction between a nice anchor as we've just seen with them up as well a nice anchor underwater for sports divers and if we start to cover it up with artificial seagrass for example um, or maybe even people want to bring things up and we want to keep it underwater that's what we have to keep in mind in situ press preservation has that kind of an issue, but also the issue of long-term commitment and the costs. So that's what um, uh, 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 what it is practically. And in situ is, of course, as we said before, is first option to consider. And therefore, we have set a few laws uh, and treaties in uh, in order. And as we look, when we look at that, we just said Treaty of Letter, ICOMOS Charter, UNESCO Convention. Then we see that actively we are preserving almost all sites underwater in situ. There's hardly any wreck that we really excavate. There's only a few of them in the old, let's say, three million uh, ones. So most of them we preserve in situ. Or do we? That's a big question, actually, because in situ preservation means obligations, means actions. If we don't do that, it is a farce. We just lose the sites and we don't even gain information. Of them. So keep that in mind. Um, what uh, if we talk about policy and law that we know, of course, law enforcement is very difficult. And I'm not only talking about the Netherlands. I talk about many countries. Uh, management of uh, underwater cultural heritage has no high prior priority for um, a lot of countries, uh, and especially in relation with economic growth. Illegal excavation is difficult to prove, at least in the Netherlands. Uh, you have to see somebody steal something from the seabed. Well, how can you do that? And in, an interesting thing in the Netherlands, which is uh, often also in other countries or many, in many other countries as well, the uh, heritage management has been decentralized in the last couple of years. And therefore, the responsibility is not only central, but it's also for municipalities. And what do they know? And what kind of uh, uh, opportunities do they have to, uh, to have law enforcement? But there is another side of the coin. Uh, so decentralization is, of course, not always good for um, the central governments to keep an eye on it. But it means that there's more access to the heritage uh, for other stakeholders. And, and therefore, this, this participation is in line with the European um, uh, of the European uh, Faro Convention and um, uh, the retreat of the central authorities makes a stronger coherence of local 
uh, skill, uh, on, on the local skill and reinforce the process of people getting more and more involved. And people getting more and more involved is stronger uh, awareness raising in maybe the biggest and strongest thing for institute protection. So the budgets, uh, there is also another side of the coin. As I said, the budgets uh, are small. Um, uh, uh, the social coherence on local level may also be uh, uh, difficult because the local authorities and the offenders um, uh, are uh, often very close uh, together. Um, and the natural threat doesn't pay any bills, so nobody's paying attention to that. So um, another thing in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in Europe is that the uh, uh, archaeological heritage management leans heavily on the Treaty of Valletta and the responsibilities on the, on the short terms are for the disturbers. So if the disturbers, um, uh, uh, if they disturb something, they have to do the first things uh, on the, uh, uh, they have to pay the first, uh, first uh, 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 um, they have to um, pay the, uh, uh, the first things uh, in, in management, but then afterwards they can just um, uh, leave the scene and then uh, there is no, nobody who's uh, taking care of the uh, ontological charities anymore. So um, the result is that most sites or many sites are just left on the seabed. And, um, uh, but there is uh, a good thing. More people are involved. There are stronger uh, laws, and, um, uh, but there is no structural money for institute preservation and monitoring. And there's a conflict, lots of conflicts of interest in institute sites with mates a management of it uh, much more difficult. And uh, another big problem is that even though sites are protected, we have to keep in mind that sites are uh, uh, degrading. So are we stuck between the rock and the hard place? Uh, can we preserve sites in situ and still enjoy, have economic gain, uh, obtain knowledge? It is very important to discuss this. It is very important to keep this uh, um, uh, uh, in, into the open and start discussing with other stakeholders about uh, the, the management. So the management has to be far more inclusive if we want to do in situ preservation and use this in situ preservation as one of those tools. Uh, so it is balancing between the different needs, making choices, uh, do stakeholder analysis. Uh, uh, so look at who has to be involved. Uh, see heritage as one of the issues in the larger area and raise awareness uh, and get more people involved. I think I will leave it um, here. Um, there is much more to say about it. And I hope this is a, um, a trigger for uh, more discussions on uh, cultural heritage uh, management, and especially in situ as part of this whole management process, uh, because I think we need to. We need to start discussing uh, about it again. Uh, look who has uh, the responsibilities. It's not only the archaeologists, but it's um, uh, but we have to look at the role that we uh, are playing because of the fact that there's more stakeholders involved. Uh, the role for the archaeologists is also changing. We have to be more mitigating. We have to be uh, uh, guiding the people in making the choices because we will not be the only ones to make the choices which sites are going to be preserved. Uh, others have to be uh, involved as well. This was my uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martijn. Um, just a few words to say, really. Um, I hope everybody found that not just super clear, but stimulating in terms of how we should be um, considering in-situ preservation. And, and Martijn made it absolutely clear that uh, there has been some change. And I'd just like to leave us with a few key words from and statements from Martin's excellent presentation. The first one that I underlined was, I uh, in situ preservation was seen as a magic pill, a panacea. And um, perhaps we all know what that's about in terms of some interpretation of no action. And I think Martin made it very clear that if in situ preservation is the option that he's chosen, and it's not the only option, then it's not just about leaving sites in situ, it's about management and actions and consequences. And that is a super important concept to take away. The other 
concept that Martijn, uh, I felt was very um, strongly made was the process about managing change. Because as he made absolutely clear, just leaving it there is not about management, it's just about leaving. So again, that implies actions, resources, consequences, but also future options. Something that for those of us who have been involved in raising awareness among stakeholders and uh, Martin made the, the issue about stakeholder analysis, I'm reading this on his last slide. This is absolutely crucial, is knowing who else has an interest in what happens to a site moving forward. Very, very, super important. An out of sight, out of mind is one of the big challenges we still face, not just to sites generally, but those we actually choose to place in situ. How many times have some of us had the conversation with the important stakeholder, the finder, typically the commercial diver or the diver or fisherman, saying, well, this is so important, we're gonna cover it up and nobody's gonna see it for 25, 30 years or whenever the next decision is made. And sometimes they look at you as though you're sort of stupid. Why aren't we digging it up? And I think it's one of our key messages is that we can't be excavating everything. And we have an obligation to choose, to decide which is significant and which, and be brave enough. And I have read enough of Martin stuff to know that deselection is one of those horrible decisions, but you may not have another choice through all sorts of reasons. But that public engagement is super important we are working, I think, in partnership with society and society takes on multiple forms in this context. An important next context was I thought law enforcement. As archeologists, we can only persuade and law enforcement can actually enforce and do something about it. But convincing law enforcement sometimes to devote precious resources onto something that may be buried is quite a difficult ask, I think but I think it's a challenge that we must face. And I really like the last comment really that I'm going to leave you with. Are we caught between a rock and a hard place? Because I think the, the whole essence of the presentation is about stimulating debate, stimulating what we mean by institute preservation, what we mean by managing change. Uh, these are all things that I think as we go forward into the next 10 years with climate change and the decade of ocean science, we're gonna be facing these decisions more increasingly, I suspect. And um, hopefully that, you know, you, the listener will have found, you know, the outline of in-situ preservation, if not crystal clear, will have stimulated some thought lines. Thanks very can much. I, can I add something, uh, Chris? Uh, yeah, of that. course you can. Yeah. Well, I, I did cut my presentation a bit short. Um, but uh, what I find, uh, I said in the beginning, I will say something about deselection. Uh, I, I didn't mention uh, it because I didn't show the last slide. But what is important, if we think about deselection and why it is so important, it's not only to, to make the burden of, for ourselves less, it is also an opportunity for us to engage with other stakeholders. Um, uh, if we deselect uh, uh, with deselection, we can um, uh, state to others that we find it less important or we have chosen other sites to prioritize, but it leaves the, uh, the possibilities open for other people to be engaged, like avocational divers, they can do their research and we can help them do their research, but they do it on that instead of those few sites that we find very important to keep. So, Deselection is an enormous uh, important part to take away a lot of burden, but also to state very clearly, this is what we find important, this is what we find less important, or this is what for our uh, reasons or means we find uh, uh, not highly uh, valued, but it can be valued for you and we can, uh, uh, you can work on that site if you want. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And I think those are absolutely valid points too. I just throw, would like to throw another penny in the pond is that what we consider important is not necessarily what the future is going to consider important. And we, we suffer that challenge too. And that's why I think consideration, stakeholder engagement, all of the things that Martin illustrated so clearly 
we have to take into consideration and give the best possible thinking to it. We don't have all the answers because we can't look into the future, but we have to do the best we can. Thanks, Martin. Crystal clear. Um, hopefully everybody else thought it was stimulating too. Thanks. Yes, now we came end of the fourth um, Commerce iCoach uh, webinar. And uh, we would like to thank uh, um, Martin, Emad, and of course, Chris as the first moderator. And we wish to see you all next month, the fifth uh, webinar of um, e-commerce iCoach. Thank you very much and have a good day. Goodbye. Thanks, Akan, and we'll see you next week. No, not next week, next month. Yeah. Okay, everybody, thank you. Goodbye.